you know, as you reflect on what you heard in the podcast and little little things that you picked up on, just remind yourself exactly what you just said. Like my story is different than yours. And so, you know, you can't just listen to my story and say, I'm going to do that, or that sounds exciting, or it worked for him. You can listen to what I said and picked out things that that stood out to you and apply them to yourself. And at the end of the day, like you should be excited about writing your own story and that you're different and that what you're creating is different and your path is going to be different. And, and that's totally okay and normal. And there's no secret to success. The secret is persistence and passion. And if you don't have those, you're not going to go anywhere. And if you do, you will eventually find your purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to It's the Bearded Man podcast with your favorite, the world's favorite bearded man, Bob Bay. Today, special guest on the podcast. He's from Greenwood, Indiana, now living in Denver, Colorado. He's a CEO, or some know him as the CDO, Chief Drinking Officer, and founder of Brewmate, the greatest koozie for your beverage. He's been selected for Forbes 30 Under 30 and Entrepreneur of the Year. Since the launch of his company in November of 2016, he and his team have grown it to over $100 million in revenue. Today on the podcast, fellow bearded brother too, it's looking pretty good through the Zoom call right now, Dylan, Jacob. How are we doing, brother? I'm doing great, Bobby. Thanks for having me on. I'm finally, I'm glad we could finally connect. Dude, stoked. We got through all the headaches of uh, technical difficulties. I, I appreciate uh, you having some patience with me walking uh, walking through that uh little bit of an issue, but uh, welcome to the remote life that we're, we're working through. Yeah, technology is great when it works. <laughs> when it works. One day I'm going to have to get like a CTO to help out on the back end so that everything <laughs> runs officially. That, that's when I'll know that I've made it when I have that. Um, you know, Dylan, honestly, like really super excited to have you on the podcast today. Uh, as I was saying before, I kind of came across you and your story sometime in 2019 I don't remember what it was or one specific moment, but I had scrolled back on our Instagram DMs and I had saw we had, I had DM'd you originally. And I think it was through a story post where you were kind of outlining your life on just some of the things that happened, had happened up until that point, up until 2019. And uh, since following you in the, over these last two years, just big fan of you. Uh, and I think the one thing that I see so true about you is just your absolute relentless hustle and just beyond honored to have you on the podcast today because I think you are a true go-getter. And if there's any type of person that I like to talk to, it's people like you who just grind and they and they love working and they love what they do. So beyond excited to have you here today, man. That means a lot, man. I'm excited to share my story. Yeah, we got a, we got a, a lot to dive into. Um, I was scrolling back and on January 1st of 2020, you had posted a, it was like a 10 slide uh, Instagram uh, about kind of 2010, 2011, you outlined the last nine or 10 years of your life. Um, and in the caption, you had said, uh, every business has been a stepping stone that paved the way for what I've been able to do with Brewmate today. The biggest takeaway I've learned over the years is that no story is the same and only I have the answers and the key to my own success story. I know that you've, you know, what people are seeing today is the product of you also have started two previous business, uh, you have GV Supply Co. You have, I think it's pronounced Vici Design, respectfully. Um, you dropped out of college while pursuing an engineering degree after interning, I think, at Rolls Royce, you know, thinking that was exactly what you wanted to do. And you're like, oh, wait, I don't know if this is. But how important is this reminder of creating your own success story been to you? It's been really important. Since the beginning, I've always been told that it's not possible. I was crazy for leaving school. I was crazy for leaving my internship. I was crazy for wanting to be self-employed. Um, it, there's the kind of a common denominator of, of you know, this, this idea that um, chasing your dreams is somehow crazy. And what I think is actually really crazy is going your whole life and kind of just living in this little bubble where you never chase anything greater than that. And so for me, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, stuck kind of in the middle. I was in school running the business that I had started, GV Supply Company you mentioned earlier, in high school out of my dorm. Um, I was making more money my freshman year of college than I would as a senior engineer. And, you know, there was still this little bit inside me that was a culmination of like every person that had ever told me that it's not possible or that it's crazy saying, maybe it is crazy. Mm. Uh, you should stay in school. You should get that degree as something to fall back on. Um, 
you know, you, you need that comfort. And I would just wasn't happy. I was, uh, relentlessly trying to balance, uh, school and living a healthy lifestyle, eating healthy, uh, going to the gym, hanging out with friends. Um, my girlfriend at the time, like trying to give attention to everybody and trying to run a business. And I just constantly had this feeling like something had to give and everything in me was saying that that wasn't GV supply company and that it wasn't, you know, eating healthy or going to the gym, that it was college. And, you know, it, there was, there was something about it that just didn't click for me. Um, and, you know, since I was a kid, I mean, I was always a straight A student. Uh, I was, I was good in school. Doesn't necessarily mean that I liked it, but I was good at it. Uh, but when I got to college, there was just something different. I no longer had to be there. Like high school is mandatory. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like grade school, high school, it's all, it's all mandatory, you know, told that it's mandatory. And so you're there uh, until you turn 18, then you drop out if you want as a senior, but like, why would you do that? Yeah. So, you know, you finish high school and, you know, it's exciting, but then college is a choice. And so for me, you know, I was making this choice really based on what everyone else wanted for me and not necessarily what I felt like was best for myself. Um, and so I got to the end of that first semester and I said, you know what, I am just going to take a semester off. I'm not going to drop out of school, but I'm going to take a semester off and I'm just going to chase this dream and I'm going to see how it does. And if you actually scroll back to my first Instagram post ever, um, it was a Facebook screen capture of me saying like, I'm leaving school. I don't care what you have to say. I'm going to make this work. And if you don't believe in me, like watch me succeed. Let's go. And, and I leave it on there because I, for me to be able to look back on that and just, be, you know, it, it, it just shows like I was the one that got to dictate my own destiny. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, had I gone in a different direction and went to school and, you know, stopped pr- pursuing, uh, you know, entrepreneurship and took a different path in life, like where I'd be today is completely different. And, and the common denominator there is me. Like yeah. I was the one that had to make that decision and, and pick and I made the right decision. I yeah. was happy. Um, I felt like I had purpose. I felt like for the first time I knew what I really wanted to do. And, and I just woke up excited. I like constantly, um, I was always excited. I was building, I was doing what I wanted to do. I felt free because at that point I basically told anyone that said that I was crazy to kind of like fuck off. <laughs> like, you know, if, if, I mean, I mean, really like I had, you know, my, my, fa- my, my family for the most part, right, I mean, actually my mom, and my dad were very supportive. Mm. Um, outside of that, my family for the most part was not, um, I had friends that, you know, were a little scared for me. <laughs> uh, you know, I had kind of worked towards this goal of, you know, being a straight A student and graduating top 10 in my class and, you know, getting a ride, full ride to Purdue and getting accepted into their engineering program. Like I had worked all these things and then just in their eyes, like kind of threw it away. Mm. But in my eyes, I was trading it for something that I believed was the real dream for me. Mm. Um, and it was. Did your parents question like when you were uh going into college at that point in time was it a no-brainer that you felt like you had to go to school or was there any hesitation of like hey i'm making more money with this business than i would probably make when i graduate as an engineer was there any thought process of maybe just not going to school at all yeah i mean a little bit um i Senior year of high school, I actually bought a Lamborghini. Um, this is a really oh, weird oh, story, oh, that's but beautiful. <laughs> I I I used to flip cars too. So as a side project, like I would flip cars, TVs, MacBooks, didn't matter. If I could get it for a good price, and I'd even make money on it, buy it. And uh, there was this 2004 Lamborghini Gallardo. I bought it for sixty five thousand dollars, which was a ridiculous deal at the time. Is that a dream car uh, at the time was, too? Oh, it was a dream car, hundred yeah, percent. Totally. But like my my insurance was like eight hundred dollars a month. Like there was no way I was keeping it. The whole point it wasn't to keep it; it was to flip it. Um, but I mean, we lived in this little podunk town in Greenwood, Indiana. And I'm rolling around in a bright orange Lamborghini. Like I think my parents that knew then that like you know I, I kind of had knew what I was doing. Yeah. Um, they they were always pretty confident in me. I think their one concern was that you know what I was doing was temporary and like, it wasn't really a retirement plan. And I kind of knew that deep down. It's like, I was going to be running, you know, and, and just for, just to reference like GV supply company was a parts supply company for iPhone repair stores. So I would sell them, um, repair screens, batteries, flex cables, 
parts for the repairs. Uh, and, and by senior year, I was working with a little over 100 repair shops around the U.S. So I had like Shopify store, Amazon store, eBay store. Um, and on the side, I flipped cars and, and did all these other things. And so, you know, I had moved out literally the day I turned 18, but I was very close with my mom, uh, close with my dad. Both of them, you know, knew what I was doing mm. and they knew that I knew what I was doing. Like they were confident in my capabilities. So yeah. I don't think it was scary for them. I think that they wanted to make sure that I was sure. And mm. so, you know, when I had told them that I was leaving, they kind of sat me down and, and they asked me, you know, what's your game plan here? <laughs> and I just explained, I said, I'm going to take a semester off. I'm going to focus on building my business and I'm going to figure out what I want out of life. Cause I don't really know right now. I felt pretty lost. Like I, I was like, honestly, probably the most depressed I'd ever been. And, and you have um, a successful business at your hands and you, and you're still feeling that. Yeah, because, okay. So you're in LA. Um, I grew up in this little small town where, uh, becoming an entrepreneur or a successful entrepreneur was the equivalent of like me being in high school acting classes mm. and saying, I'm going to move to LA and become a movie star. Mm. And I use that reference a lot, but like you're raised to believe that all you can achieve is going to school, getting a degree and getting a good job and anything outside of that. Is Impossible. Crazy. Exactly. Um, and actually freshman year of college, there was this introductory freshman course that I had to take. And one of the, the introductory exercises that they did, they had everyone in the room uh, stand up and they were just asking about salaries. Um, it's a super weird exercise. I have no idea why they did this, like kind of put people on the spot and it was really awkward. Um, but they had everyone stand up and they said, if you would be happy making $50,000 a year, sit down. And like a couple of people sat down and they said, if you'd be happy making a hundred thousand dollars a year, sit down. And like half the class sat down and they're like, if you would be comfortable making $250,000 a year, sit down. And pretty much everyone in the class sat down except for like three or four people. And then they said, if you would be comfortable making half a million dollars or, more, or half a million dollars a year, sit down. And I was the last person standing. And I remember that my teacher said, what do you want to be an NBA star? And I was like, the fact that you believe that the only way to be successful is to be a professional athlete just shows that you live in this little bubble where you like have no idea what's actually happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And, and I just saw this disconnect. And for me in my mind, like I wasn't happy with the idea that that was all that I could achieve or obtain. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was something that I just kind of sat down with my parents and I explained to them, I said, I'm not happy. I, you know, I had this business in front of me, but it was like this awkward position where I didn't see myself as an entrepreneur at the time. Like I had this business that was making money, but I was the only employee. It was more like I had created a high paying job for myself, mm. but I didn't see myself like one, becoming a millionaire from it. And two, didn't see myself being able to support myself through retirement. Like it wasn't a retirement plan, mm. but I thought it was the start of something. Like it was like, I want to chase this and I can learn from it and I want to keep doing this. Um, and so, you know, the concept for me was let's just see how it goes. And, you know, I told them that I said, I'm, I'm making money, you know, I'm supporting myself. I'm taking a semester off, I'm not losing anything. If anything, I can go back next year if it doesn't work out. And in that, during that time frame, um, one of our biggest clients that was a uh, big franchise in the Midwest, and actually they're a nationwide franchise, but one of the guys that owned the Indiana, Kentucky, and Ohio locations was one of our biggest clients. And he said, hey, I want to make an introduction to corporate. They're really interested. Um, you know, they've, they've heard about our experience with you guys. They're interested in potentially bringing you on as a vendor for all the stores. Um, and so it was a little bit over 100 stores in the U.S. So it's basically doubling our, our store count overnight doubling the business and potential overnight. And that was really exciting. Um, but in those conversations, they actually ended up making an offer to buy us out hmm. because for the cost that, I mean, so, so long story short, they bought us for a hundred thousand dollars, which if you break it down at a store level is like a thousand dollars a store hmm. to basically take over our supply chain network. Like they just wanted to know who our suppliers were and wow. they didn't want to put in the legwork to get it. Wow. So when they took it over, they like shut down the eBay store. They shut down the Amazon, stopped selling the customers and just integrated it into their supply chain. Um, but it was like, it was this really exciting moment for me where I was like, oh, like 
I'm a success. I successfully exited my first business, <laughs> you know, and I mean, it's not a multi-billion dollar exit, but I was like, I built something of value totally. and someone saw enough in it to give me six figures when I'm 19. Like I'm excited about it. And, yeah. you know, so, so for me, that was kind of what I would say was a slight pivotal moment. I still didn't really consider myself an entrepreneur. There was a lot of doubt in me about like, if, if I could achieve the level of success that I dreamed about, but I knew that in order to ever even get close to that, I had to at least take the initial steps and just continue pursuing it. And if it didn't end up working out, I always had, I could always go back to school. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I, I took that money, I bought another house or sorry, another house. I bought a house. I was like an old 1950s farmhouse. How old are you at this time uh, now? Perspective wise? 19. 19. 19. Buying a house. And, Bought a house. I thought I was going to do an HGTV house flip <laughs> uh, three months, make a hundred grand. You know how they present it on TV. Totally. What it turned out to be was a year. Um, I made 40 grand before realtor fees and uh, it was a huge nightmare. But in the process, uh, you know, I, I learned a lot. I did that entire house myself watching YouTube videos wow. and reading forums and um, and when I say, I mean, I literally gutted the whole house down to the studs. I was replacing load bearing walls. I was pulling permits and submitting architectural drawings. I pulled electrical permits and ran all the electric in the house and then hired someone to tie it into the panel. I mean, I learned a lot yeah. and I learned enough to know I never want to do that again. <laughs> and I will never, ever fix anything on my house again, either. I will call someone totally. for literally the simplest things totally. so over it. Totally. But in that process, I was just looking for the next idea. Like, how can I create value? And so the value I knew at the time was, you know, I, I could just look at things in front of me and say, uh, I, I, kept, I kept a journal. So I would, I would keep a journal and be like, I don't like the way that this works. Mm. Or, you know, where my second business came from was uh, in the design process. I went into this uh, granite tie or granite showroom, like hundreds of slabs of granite, tons of different colors. Um, and I picked out the slab of granite that I wanted and then went into a design showroom looking for a, spe a specific color of glass tiles, like a light, um, like cream color. And they didn't have anything even close. And then what I found was they didn't have really anything. Mm -hmm. uh, they had like four or five different colors of this glass tile. And uh, that, that to me like rang as like, oh, opportunity. You know, this is why you're, um, so build, I was this always, why you're building the house. I was just, I was always looking for these little things where it was like opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. And sometimes it would be so stupid. I mean, it would, it would just, you know, I'd be like, oh, like here's an idea. And then I would look up like who the competitors are in the space and how big the industry is and whatever. And most of the times they didn't work out. But in this case it did. I found that, you know, when I was in that showroom, I was talking to the lady, she was actually the owner of the showroom. And I was asking her about like what vendors, uh, they worked with what vendors were out in the space you know was the issue that i was having pretty common and basically what she said to me was glass tiles become really popular but no one has really created a lot of color variation for it and so i knew nothing about tile um but i knew a little bit about sourcing and i knew how to start a business and so i said i'm gonna start a glass tile company <laughs> and and the concept was really simple it was i wanted to create the largest color selection for glass tile so for glass subway tile, different shapes, three by six, four by 12, kitchens, bathrooms, backsplashes, commercial remodels, doesn't matter. Um, and I know that I can find, you know, enough showrooms to carry the tile. You know, I knew that like on Wayfair and Overstock, I could list the product there. So I knew that there was a market. I didn't know how big it was. But again, like I was working on this house at the time. I needed something else for me because mm. I, I was like burnt out on the house three months in. And so, you know, that the additional like nine months that it took me to finish that house, I was just looking for other concepts. And so I, uh, I got a Chinese visa. I went out to China and visited a couple of factories. I spent two weeks in Beijing, uh, went to the great wall of China, stayed in a hostel, met a bunch of cool people. Um, probably one of the most memorable trips of my life. I was 19 and you know, it was, it was just a really cool experience for me to like get out in the world by myself um, the, the hostel thing was actually something that I had done in previous trips, but it was like, anytime I go to a foreign place, I would put myself in the most uncomfortable situations I could. And so it was like, I wanted to be in a hostel with a bunch of people that I don't know 
to put myself out of my comfort zone and force me to like meet people wow. and, and put myself out there. And so I did that for, for the whole two weeks I was there. I was in a bunch of different hostels all over Beijing and outside of Beijing. And I met so many awesome people. But in the process, you know, I got to go visit like my first Chinese factory. Um, when I got to this factory specifically that I was uh, I was working with, they had like a big welcome sign in the front that said like, welcome Dylan Jacob. Wow, you know? that's official. And, uh, that's official. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and as a 19 year old, I mean, I felt like a, a movie star. Like, I was like, oh my Red gosh, carpet this is rolled so out, real. champagne's popping, Dylan's here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it, and I, I came back from that just so inspired. Like, I wasn't excited about tile, but I was excited that I was creating something. Mm. And for me, that is a very important differentiator because it'll tie into like why Brewmate came to be what it is. But in all these businesses, they allowed me to be creative and to create. Um, and that was what I really enjoyed about it. But what I didn't enjoy was that in these businesses, I was really just like kind of taking an existing market and tweaking it a little bit to fill a gap. Um, which in of itself is respect, like to, to step up and do that though, is still a huge leap to take, to see a market and go, this is what's missing. Let me step in. And I might not be creating something from scratch, but to say I can do, I can deliver a better product or a better service in of itself is a massive leap to take. Absolutely. Yeah. But like my childhood movie star dream was to be an inventor. Um, that was why I wanted to be an engineer. Mm. I mean, I wanted to be able to like create something from scratch and walk around and see people using a product that I created. Like they came from my mind. Mm. Um, and these businesses didn't really have that. And that was okay. I, again, I was enjoying the process. Vichy design took off really quickly. The first year we did almost a hundred thousand dollars in sales. Um, we were on overstock. We were on house. We were on Wayfair. We were working with like 30 tile showrooms just in Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio. Um, and, uh, I think we had a couple in Michigan, but it, it was something that was keeping me busy, but I was always looking for that next idea. The, the, the one that I could create from scratch that, that like meaningful, uh, meaningful venture, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, and so I kept this journal, uh, same thing, the same journal that I would jot down business ideas, but I would jot down product ideas, invention ideas, whatever. Um, I started a couple other small businesses in the meantime, just for fun. Um, 2015 <laughs> Christmas, just Christmas. Yeah, businesses. I started, it was called naughty cold box. So it like went viral. Um, it was on Huffington post and like all these different, uh, news websites, but the concept was that you could send a box of cold to anyone in the U S with a handwritten note from Santa. And, uh, oh, it was, you know, funny, whatever. I literally made nothing. I made like 10 grand, um, mm. in profit. I think we did like 20 something thousand dollars in sales total over like this eight week period we were promoting it. Um, but it was, again, I liked starting, I liked building, I liked creating. And, you know, it, the idea wasn't to be a millionaire from these ideas. It was just like something for me to do in my spare time. It was almost like a hobby. Mm. Um, but the longer I went on with Vici design, the more I was searching for what I was missing and the more I like got to know myself and what I truly enjoyed about being a business owner and, and where I felt like I was lacking. And what I was lacking was the meaning behind the company. Mm -hmm. None of these companies really had like, I didn't have a vision mm -hmm. behind them. I had it, I, I was providing value, but I didn't have a vision for like where it was starting and where I wanted it to go and like the steps in between. Uh, and so I, I just, I felt like I was a little stuck. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, I could go to another tile showroom and get them to carry our tile and whatever, expand the business. But like, that wasn't really a vision. Yeah, where no do we want to be in five years? We're not even thinking about yeah. that. We're worried about where we're going to be next week. Yeah. So, so I was just missing that. Um, and the idea for Brewmate, honestly, was the most simple idea. Actually, I probably ever jotted down in my journal. Mm. Uh, most of the ideas I had were really complex. Um, some of them I chased pretty far and then just stopped working on because they ended up you know, I decided they weren't worth pursuing. Yeah. Um, but the concept for brewmate started really easy. I was at Indy 500. Uh, we were drinking 16 ounce Sun King beers, which are like, it's a craft brewery in Indiana. Uh, all they have is 16 ounce beers. And the last quarter of that beer was always warm. And this was the summer before. Um, and, and I didn't really think anything of it at the time, but I just remember thinking back to that moment of like how bad that sucked. And then as we were moving into the next year, I continued to think on this a little bit more and I was like, you know what, like 
why has no one created anything for 16 ounce beer cans? And so I remember I just jotted down in my journal, like something to keep 16 ounce cans cool. And so, you know, I didn't know anything about insulated drinker. Honestly, I didn't even know it really existed. I'd seen people carrying around like their thermoses and tumblers and stuff, yeah. but I didn't know anything about that space. Um, but I did a quick search and I was actually searching first for like neoprene koozies. Um, no one made anything, you know, any neoprene koozies for 16 ounce cans. I was like, huh, that could be an opportunity, mm. but those don't really keep your beer cold. Like they keep your hand warm. Um, and then I discovered that there were insulated beer can coolers on the market. Uh, Yeti specifically, they had a 12 ounce can cooler and the Amazon rankings were terrible. I wasn't seeing a ton of reviews for it. Um, out of all the products that they have, like when I'd go into a retail setting, I didn't really see it. So I started doing research on that space. Like I didn't, again, I didn't know anything about insulated drink or so I was like, who all is in the space? Is anyone making anything for 16 ounce cans? Um, and in that process, like I kind of became a professional in drinkware. Like I knew what everyone's strengths and weaknesses were. And all I saw in this chart that I had created was this giant gap for alcohol. Mm. Like no one was making anything for alcohol, nothing for slim cans, nothing for 16 ounce cans. No one had ever made an insulated wine tumbler or champagne flu. Like there was all this, these areas of opportunity. Light bulb, baby. And light bulb went off. And so the first concept was the Hopslater trio. Um, it was a 16 ounce can cooler that would keep your 16 ounce beer cans cold till the last drop. So when you open up that beer, if you're out in the 90 degree heat, you can open it up, come back 15 minutes later and it's crisp and cold. That was the concept. I had no idea if people would buy it. Again, like the sales rankings for similar products for like 12 ounce cans weren't really selling. But my thought was like, I guarantee like with how big craft beer was at the time and how much it was growing, the majority of those people were or the majority of the breweries were using these 16 ounce cans. And so I was like, surely there's enough people that I can sell some of these. Totally. I, I don't know how big if it's People are drinking that beer, they so, value it, and they want that baby to be cold to the last drop. Yeah, if you're paying $8 for a beer, like you're going to totally. want that to be cold to the last drop, totally. right? Um, and so that was literally how it started. I mean, that was that was the very beginning of brewing. Yeah. I mean, dude, so I, I love this because you you literally walked the path that I wanted to touch on some of like the early businesses and how you got to where you are today. I think it's very obvious to me that from the jump and even something I had came across like when you were a kid, you had started like cutting grass at a young age. And I think that might have stemmed from uh, even from what I had researched, like I think your parents got divorced when you were young. So I think it just forced you to ha kind of hustle and find ways to make money for yourself. And I think those minor lessons so young that so much was part of my life starting to work at 12 got me to where I am today and have just, you can't teach work ethic. And I think that's literally so obvious about you when you were just like starting all these ideas, having the confidence to just go for it. It's really just amazing because in of it itself, like I was saying, like it's such an achievement to have an, a vision and then go for it. And you've just done this consistently time over time over time. And um, it's, you know, especially when people are hearing this episode today or they see what Dylan's up to today, we see Brumet and the success, but it's like, there's so much behind the scenes that led to this moment. It wasn't just like light bulb. I'm just going to start this company and we're going to make a shit ton of money. It was like all these like minor lessons along the way, uh, which is, it's just like, so like beautiful. Um, I know that when you were originally launching the company though, and I didn't realize this is it originally was named cryo gear. Um, and then you had to change the name because you were, you were sued for it. You had said though, uh, quote unquote, that this was the best thing to ever happen to you. Why is that? Uh, so when I came up with the concept for the hop slater, it wasn't a business idea. It was a product idea. So I like, I came up with the name for the product and which I really liked. I mean, we still use it to this day. Um, it was like a hops insulator, mm. hops slater. Um, but I didn't have a business name behind it. And I need, I wanted to create a separate venture from what I was already working on. So I wanted to keep up, like create a separate business entity and just kind of keep it separate from what I was doing, new bank accounts, everything else. And so I just created a name cryo means cold. So it was like cold gear. And it was just like a really quick thing that I, you know, st I, I started the business under, um, and it just kind of took like after, cause I didn't, again, I didn't know what the hops later was going to do or if people were going to want it or whatever. But after it took off, we were kind of stuck with the name cryo. And then I felt really awkward about like changing it because people already knew it by that. And I was worried that like it would hurt the brand. Mm. Um, so it had been in the back of my mind that I wanted to change it, but I didn't really have like that fire under my ass to make me. 
until like we got that lawsuit and they were like, you have to change your name. And I was like, sweet. <laughs> now I got to do <laughs> Let's this. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. So it, it really forced my hand to, to make that change. You write them uh, a yearly uh, and, Christmas card. Thank you so much for suing me. This ultimately helped change the, the title and the name of the brand. Yeah. I mean, they, they really did. I don't know that. I mean, I'm sure eventually I would have hated it enough to change it, yeah. but it definitely expedited the process. Wow. Um, how just even getting that technology though, to allow the, the beer and the beverage to stay cold. I think it took around 14 rounds of prototypes, which I know was in and of itself, like a process. How, how was the process of actually finding that technology? Was it hard? Was everything on the internet or how did you go about that? No. Yeah. I mean, so insulated drink were actually started in the early 1900s as a way to keep um, like soup uh, warm. Mm. Like it started off for a, more of like a thermos type deal. Um, and over time, uh, there was technology that evolved for like liquid nitrogen tanks and stuff like that, that started to be applied to drinkware. Um, I sort of just figured out like what everyone else was doing in the space and then like where the technology could go. So I started working with the manufacturer Um, you know, at the time, most people were just doing this like double wall vacuum insulated technology. Um, this like copper layer is what they use in the liquid nitrogen tanks. And so I had asked our manufacturer if that was something we could do, because it'd be like a differentiator. And they were like, yeah, you can, it's just really expensive, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't care. Like I wanted to keep it colder than the competition. No one had anything for 16 ounce cans, but still like, I wanted to make sure that like beer was ice cold. Like I wanted it to be the coolest thing people like had ever tried. Mm. Um, So, yeah, I mean, it was just, it it was fairly simple in the sense of like, I was reapplying technology to a different type of product. Mm. Um, So, you know, when, when you think about all the products that we have, I mean, a lot of the innovation is around like our hop slider series, for instance, Um, the, the trio comes from the fact that you can use it for a 16 ounce can It has an adapter. So you can use it for a 12 ounce can. And it comes with a lid, so you, it, you can use it as a tumbler. Unbelievable! Um, so we're the first company to like create a beer koozie that you could drink out of as a cup. So it had like this dual purpose. You have that trademark? Um, I think, is that true? You have that trademark too, so no other business can do that. Yeah, we have a, we have like three utility patents just on that. <laughs> oh my god! Um, it was like the first patent that I'd ever filed for. Um, you know, as a first time founder, you know, for anyone that's trying to to get a patent, you can actually pay an expedited fee as a first time founder. And they actually have to give you an answer within 12 months. Um, patents can take three to four years, but you can get a few, uh, you can get a few patents. I think it's three patents, um, as a first, as time. A first time inventor pass through within a year, as long as you have protectable IP. Um, and so we did, we got those passed through within a year. So it was like really exciting. Um, but that technology has become a staple in all of our beer koozies. Like all of them can be used as cups. Um, the multifunctionality has become a staple in all of our products. So we're always thinking about ways to make all of our products have more than one function. Yeah. Um, so we have like our pint glass can be used as a cocktail shaker. Um, you know, we have our fifth bottle, which holds a whole fifth of vodka. And then it has like a <laughs> shot. It has, it has a shot glass. That, so the lid, when you unscrew it is actually a shot glass. So you can like pour and measure, but then we have like a straw attachment. So you can turn it into a water bottle. So like Multi-purpose we have all these different ways. Yeah, like I, I really tried to make our products as valuable as possible to the consumer so you can kind of use it for all these different use cases. Um, and so that's like another big differentiator. Like a lot of the stuff that was out there was very like singular purpose. Um, right now, we're actually uh, moving towards being the world's first completely leak proof drinkware line. So we invented this new Bevlock lid. It's part of like our move collection, uh, but it's 100% leak proof. Like, I don't know if you saw my Instagram stories, but I was like, Red wine in the toddy, shaking it over oh, my white this. couch. I miss like, that's how much I trust well, that's it. Confidence. Um, so we're we're like moving all of our drinkware. We'll be moving to that. So we'll be like the first drinkware line ever um, that will have this technology. Everyone else, at least, you can't throw it in your bag. You can't do whatever. So all of our stuff, you can literally fill it up, throw it in a bag, go. Never have to worry about it leaking. Um, but the evolution of that, I mean, it all started with the hopsolator, and I was just constantly looking for new opportunity. Um, and, you know, I, I saw this space, drinkware. Mm-hmm. Um, I was reading up on drinkware. There was a lot of free reports on how, you know, it was one of the fastest growing sectors in the houseware space. All these brands were skyrocketing in sales, um, but no one was paying attention to alcohol. And I was like, either they just haven't gotten there yet, like this hasn't evolved to that point, or 
they tried it and it doesn't work, but I couldn't find anything about anybody making a lot of the concepts that I had. So for me, it was like, I'm going to try it and see if it works, <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, in that process, I got, again, I, I got really intimate with the brands that were in the space. I realized that none of them were doing direct to consumer. They were all relying on brick and mortar for building their businesses. Um, all of them were targeting an older demographic. So no one was focused on like the 21 to 35 year old age demographic. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was like this perfect opportunity to like create products that had never been created, sell them on a channel where no one else is selling them and reach a new customer demographic in the way that they prefer to be reached and build a brand and relationship with a demographic that doesn't care about drink work currently. Yeah. And so my challenge was, is like, you know, with every product that we launch, there's a theory around, you know, who the customer is going to be and how do we show them the value through a computer screen or through, a, through their phone, right? Mm -hmm. Like if this is brand new and no one's created it, like I need to make sure that the visuals we're using, the copy that we're using is explaining very quickly, like how it's going to benefit them. Um, and so we got really good at that early on, um, saw a lot of success and then now we're here. It's, it's crazy <laughs> that you, so you guys start as uh, with the hopsulator and then it just evolves. I mean, you've already mentioned it, but just to bring that back, mm -hmm. like wine and tumblers, spirits and barware, co uh, coffee and mugs, rehydration, water bottles, the coolers are absolutely insane. Like looking at those just through some of the content. So what's been some, one of the greatest lessons that you've learned in like this whole product development process, because obviously like. Once you kind of have the technology down or the understanding of like the product, I guess it's a little bit easier to then like step into the wine, step into the coolers. But there still is a whole process of like you, you could have designed a cooler in a million different ways. But yet you guys create this backpack and it's like dope and it looks like a, just a party of fun. So what's been the greatest lesson with I'm sure even now you can think about the products that you want to roll out in the next 12, 18, 24 months. But you have to also go, Dylan slow down we we got to take a one product at a time so what's been like one of the there's big no slowing down no we have down. like eight no there's like always a million things <laughs> going on at once okay um but yeah i mean so so what i'm looking for when i'm creating a product is one opportunity so you know has anyone done this if they have can we do it better mm -hmm. so that's kind of the starting point um there's a lot of products that we haven't launched uh, like our toddy mug for instance which is like our 16 ounce uh coffee mug mm -hmm just launched. I could have launched a coffee mug years ago, but I didn't because we didn't have that differentiator. Now we have the move in Bevlock technology that like makes it the world's first leak proof handled mug. Mm. Right. So for me, it's always been really important that Timing. if we're launching something, we're launching it with purpose and that we have a reason for doing it. And our reason is innovation. Like we need to make sure that we're bringing something substantially different to the market that we can present to our customers and they continue to see us as a leader in the space. Like, that's mm -hmm. very important for me. So we don't do anything unless I have a solid case for why this is different and why customers are going to get additional value out of this. And then it goes into really just studying the market. So if I have a concept around, let's say the wine tumbler. Um, so for the wine tumbler, I did a little bit of research um, on wine glasses specifically, you know, use cases for wine glasses, you kind of already know, but the wine insulator was the product that actually created the wine glass. So like the wine glass didn't come first. Um, I had gotten a ticket on the beach for having glass on the beach. I had a bottle of wine with me. And my concept was I can create something that'll hold a full bottle of wine. You can take it into glass free zones and it'll keep it cold. So that, that situation created this concept for me, for the wine insulator. And that opened up this new door where I was like, well, now customers can bring a bottle of wine to the beach, but what are they drinking? At? <laughs> and so, you know, are you drinking out of a solo cup? It's not a wine glass because you can't have glass at the oh, beach. Man. You're using plastic. It's porous. It's a terrible drinking experience. So like every product, it's, it's an evolution of, you know, there's every product has its own story, yeah. like how it came to be. Um, but, you know, it, it starts with, okay, I wanted to create this insulated wine tumbler, but anyone ever done it before? No. Cool. Mm. Okay. Study wine glasses. Like, so I would go on Amazon and search wine glasses and just see which ones were highest rated and what people liked about them. And what I found was like ergonomics, the way it fit in your hand, blah, blah, blah. Um, the biggest gripe that I had was a lot of these people were like, it's too small. Um, and so I was like, okay, you know what? People like, want to drink. They want to fill it up. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, my first concept was, you know what, we'll launch like a standard size wine glass and just see how it does. I didn't really, I wasn't super invested in the idea because I didn't know how people would get behind it, uh, especially for wine. Like 
there's a lot of wine snobs. And so they're like, you know, they only drink out of the nicest glassware, whatever. But for the use case that this was being used in, you can't bring that there. So it's like the next best thing. Mm -hmm. And that was my theory was like, if I can provide the next best thing that can be used in glass free zones and it keeps their wine perfectly chilled, I think people will see value in it. And they did. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, as we were moving into other categories like champagne flute, I was studying champagne flutes and why champagne flutes are shaped the way they are, why they're so small. Um, champagne flutes on average are six to seven ounces. The reason that they're that size is because champagne goes flat really quickly and anything above that pouring size goes flat. Mm. Um, and so that was an area of opportunity. It was like, well, what if I could create a bigger champagne flute, but design a lid that would keep the carbonation in? So we did. We created our champagne flute as a flip top lid. So uh, when you're not drinking it, you flip it over. It's completely sealed. When you flip it open, uh, you get the wow. same drinking experience. So uh, and, and I so champagne flutes are the shape that they are because um, it's part of the drinking experience to be able to experience the bubbles on your nose. So it, it's like this really narrow cylindrical shape. So like we kept the same shape, basically doubled it and then created this unique lid design that allowed you to get the exact same drinking experience. So it was an open lid experience. Um, and then when it was closed, it would hold it, hold in the carbonation. And so, you know, every product that we have has a similar story, um, you know, as to like how I discovered that, you know, people wanted this um, or, or why I thought that they did into, you know, why we developed it the way that we did. Um, you know, the back tap has a, a very similar story. Um, yeah, I, 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 it's all, it's all different. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing is just like purpose, making sure that you're, you know, if, if you're launching a brand, if you're launching a product, whatever it is, like you really have to understand why you're doing it. Because if you don't understand why you're doing it, your customer's not. So key. And it's so obvious that even as you're talking it through that, you know, you have this, first off, I hope to God you saved that ticket. Cause if you did, you gotta, you gotta frame that. Like that's, that's iconic. But, um, it's so obvious that it's like, you know, you're smart enough where you think of these ideas and then it's like, let me do the research. Let me understand like what's out there in the market. How can, what, you know, going on Amazon, reading the reviews, like trying to understand like, why do people like this product? Why do they like this product? How can we combine these and then use that to make a better product? So it's so obvious that not only is it purpose driven, but then you're doing the research, which is the beauty of the internet. All the answers are literally out there. You know, 20 years ago, you probably would have had to, you would have had a host like a, a, a wine tasting to get everyone in there with the different prototypes, which would take you 18 months of getting, you know, 10 different prototypes, and whatever. Now it's just so much sped up because everything is so accessible online. But the key, as you said, purpose driven. And then wh who's the market? Is there anybody out there that actually needs this product or are we just creating it because Dylan thinks it's good or somebody else on the team thinks it's good. And then we go to sell it and all this work that we put in behind the scenes, there's not, there's nobody there to buy it. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's so clear to me. Um, looking at the growth though, like unbelievable launch in 2016 within two months, November, 2016 to the end of the year, you guys end up doing 250 K in sales, which I think is a credit to you. I think there's a lot of like, um, there was a lot of uh, hype beforehand so that when, when you guys actually had the product and inventory, there was a bunch of people on the wait list and it was like the holidays, but massive growth. I mean, two years or excuse me, two months, you guys do 250 K sales, 2017, you do 2.1 mil revenue, 2018, 21 mil revenue, 2019, 40 mil. And then 2020 from what I read online over a hundred million. I mean, what are the variables that are allowing you to scale at this speed? This is, I mean, these are massive, massive numbers. We could have scaled faster if I had the money, seriously. Um, like, again, I mean, when I think about Brewmate, when I think about a business, right? Like, usually you are fighting for customers. Like, you are fighting for customers. You're really trying to make yourself stand out. Um, and we just had this, like, unbelievable open playing field where we were creating the first, like I wasn't competing against anyone. Like we were the only company with the 16 ounce can cooler. We were the only company with the slim can cooler for like truly, um, you know, white claw, whatever for three and a half years until Yeti launched there three and a half years after we launched it. I mean, so for literal years, like we had so many products that we were the only ones that had them. Yeah. And so we've continued that trend, like making sure that we have these significant differentiators where, yeah, customers can, can compare whatever they want, but if there's nothing to compare to, like there's no other option. And so for us, what we really excelled at is 
not just the innovation component, but having the best customer service, having the best warranty, like having the best experience possible for every customer from start to finish, not just including product. And so we created this really strong business where like our customers not only love the product, but they loved us. And we created this following that like has just continued to grow and grow and grow. How did you, and how, how did you do that though? That's so important to like, not only are you delivering a, a high quality product that your customer enjoys, but then they become like this, this like walking, talking billboard where it's like, oh, I'm using the proving. I'm not using that Yeti bullshit. Like how, how are how have you guys been able to do that? Cause that is really the secret sauce to continuing the growth is building that strong community. Yeah. I mean, community is built around people that have similar beliefs, mm. uh, people that, that are using similar products. Like there's so many different ways to build community. Um, but for us, we really didn't know in the beginning, like I, I had no idea how to build a community. I'd never done it before. Right. Like I ran a parts distribution company for iPhones and a tile distribution company, <laughs> like didn't know community. It wasn't a community. But what Come I on. found, I mean, yes, yeah, small, <laughs> small community, but I mean, m most of that was B2B. Right. Yeah. And so working directly with consumers was really new to me. Um, and so I just thought about like, what did I really like about the product and what did I like about the brand and how can I let that shine through in the brand itself? Mm. Um, and so, you know, from the get go, like we, I created kind of a persona for the brand and the way we talk to customers and interact with them. And that persona was me because for the first year and a half, I was the one doing it. Um, but it was something where, you know, I, I don't even, I, I honestly, I wish that I had a way to explain mm. how it came to be but it started building community on its own. And then I started realizing why people were flocking to the brand and how to, to like capitalize on that. Yeah. Basically. Um, and so what, what happened was, is like the first year. So we launched the hop slater, we launched the wine slater. And what I found was like, people were really engaged. They were in the comment section. They were engaging with the brand. They were engaging with each other, talking about wow. use cases, how they're going to use this at the beach wow. and you know, wherever else and how it'd be the perfect gift. And so for me, I was like, this product is something that's used in social settings. So I wanted to create a way for people to connect together and make it almost like roommate was a community. So I created this Facebook group in early 2018. So again, 2017, we had had a $2 million a year. I was really more focused at the time about like the brand was kind of finding its footing. We had just changed our name like February, 2017, something like that. Um, so we were kind of just selling product. I was listening to customers, but what I found was that there was already community within our Facebook comments. So I wanted to give people a place to have true community. And so that became this Facebook group. Um, and that group now is like over 30,000 people from all around the world. Wow. Um, but what I found in the process was that people, what people really liked about the brand was our messaging, the way that we presented the products, um, which specifically is mostly in so social settings and how we can use that to show them how it can make their lives better. Mm. And, and it's making it better through a better drinking experience. Um, so like our tagline is drink better, but it's also making it better through community, like sharing that experience with other people yeah. and not just sharing it just with your friends, but now you can share it with a group of 30,000 people. And, you know, we're super engaged on Instagram with our customers. We're super engaged in the comments on ads with our customers. Um, and we built the community around honestly, just like making people feel like they're a part of something. And they did that on their own. Like I didn't create that. Like, wow. I just saw it. And I said, I want to give people a way to do that on a larger scale. Here, and I want this to be a core pillar. Yeah. And, and also I wanted to bake that in as like a core pillar of what we were trying to do as a brand, which was to connect people and to create community. And, you know, so, so over time, I mean, we really changed. If you look at a lot of our ads, uh, you know, what the way we position the brand, it's really community, like it's, it's around community. It's around doing things together with other people. It's really like fun and outgoing. And, um, and if you go to the VIP group, it's the same way people sharing their experiences with other people, how they're using the product for the weekend, what they're up to wow. the new house that they just bought, like whatever. It's like, it's a big group of like friends. Wow. Um, and none of the other brands have that. Like they're just, you know, here's a product, you know, Yeti specifically is really of a status symbol. Like 
people, it kind of, it was just like, I have a Yeti, mm-hmm. you know, and I didn't want to be that brand. Like I wanted a brand to be a brand with a purpose, not just keeping your alcohol cold, but like a brand that when people think about us, like they have a deeper connection to, because like, that's what creates lifelong relationships with customers. And I didn't know how to do that. So, you know, I can't take credit for, you know, I, th- there wasn't like some special thing that I did. I just honestly listened and and understood how to connect the dots mm-hmm. and and took that and created the community and turned it into what it is now. Oh man, that's so good. It what's well, so clear that obviously you had you had to have a great product, which everybody that was buying the product was a fan of. But then to recognize and see that, you know, what is what is Brewmate allowing? It's allowing for people to gather more often and keep their beverages cold. Like, yes, that is the the purpose of the product is to keep the beverage cold, but I think what it's doing and allowing is promoting more community and it's, it's being used in these community environments where then it becomes like, wait, what, what is that? That's not a regular koozie. Like, tell me about it. And then they become the word of mouth and just, but the, to, to, to recognize and see like, wow, uh, people are Mm -hmm. like vibing out in the comments about like where they're going to use it this weekend. And then to go, let me create this Facebook group and put everybody there. I mean, it's just absolutely genius. And I think, uh, it's, it's so cool to see, a brand be able to do that because as you know, better than anybody else, that ends up being the best core base that you're ever going to find in, in some of your customers, which is, uh, which is amazing. Um, a few months ago, you have any, you're about to jump in. Sorry. No. Yeah. I mean, I was just going to say, so in, in the beginning, you know, I, I really wasn't trying to build community, but I had this email list, um, for specifically for the wine slider and for the hop slider of any customers that bought it. And I would send them out surveys like from me and mm. notes and like, just get an understanding of what they liked, what they didn't like. And so for, from the very beginning, I was always just listening to people about what they, you know, taking their feedback and using it to create the best version of the product. It's genius. And the VIP group, like our, the Facebook group has turned into a platform for customers to be able to have a say in the way that the brand evolves. Um, new product launches, new color launches, things that they do and don't like about our customer service or shipping. <sighs> like the, it's a sounding board for people to be able to, be heard. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm in there every day responding to people. So like, you know, what other brand do you know where, you know, they're, you know, especially in the drinkware space, like there's no other brand where the CEOs in a Facebook group talking to people and using their feedback to create the best version of products and doing color launches and things like that. And so that it, it really stemmed from the beginning. And I kind of incorporated that into the group, but now we have a brand that's like built for the people kind of by the people Ooh. like they they get to have a say in everything and i want to continue that forever like i feel like that has created a bond closer than anything i mean i remember one of our customers uh positioned me she was like you should create an ombre series like oh hadn't hadn't thought of that let me i'll run a poll <laughs> people like i love ombre so i gave her like a thousand dollars in ombre product wow. and like she's still in this vip group to this day we're we're doing a new version of ombre it's been three and a half years since that first version of the ombre launch we're doing this new launch this summer and um she sent me a message and was like hey i don't know if you remember me but like i was the one that gave you the idea for the original ombre just wanted to say i'm still here and like so glad to be a part of this journey and i just messaged back i was like i of course i remember you like i i remember this conversation i I could scroll back and see and like vividly remember you know three and a half years ago like just and, and, and i think about every product and like i can literally picture comments of like someone that told me, you know, you should do this, or I don't like this or whatever, and how that created a new way of thinking about a product or whatever it is. And so it's no longer just me. It's like the products are kind of, it's, I listen, I listen, I hear, you know, the number one thing I heard throughout the years is I wish someone would make a leak proof drinkware line. Mm. You guys should make a leak proof drinkware line. And I kept hearing it and hearing it and hearing it. And I finally said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to give them a leak proof drinkware line. And so it's just that that community outside of you know just creating a place for people to be able to connect with people from all over the world and feel like they're a part of something they also get to feel like they're a part of the brand yeah like they're helping to build the brand well props to you being open-minded and being willing to actually like have those conversations and and take people's feedback and actually run with it because i'm sure there's people out here and ban- brands and business where ceos might be in a position where like they don't, they don't, I'm not saying it's true, but they might be in a position where they think it's either their ideas or it's the highway. So, I mean, it's just props to you and it's clearly working. And I think it, it's the best thing you can do because it's like, these are literally your customers. They're telling you what they like, what they don't like making these adjustments. And it's probably going to speak to the larger population. So it's like, it's, just, it's such a yeah. win-win. There's a lot of new founders. Um, they have this thing where they believe 
you know, their idea is their baby and they believe that it's the perfect product or idea or whatever. But in reality, they think it's perfect for them. And guess what? You're not paying yourself. Yeah. You're not the one buying the product. You need this to be perfect for the people that are going to be standing behind your brand and using the product. And if they don't like it, like you better listen. Yeah. And I tell people that all the time. I'm like, it does not matter what you think is the best way to do things. You can have theories and sometimes they'll be right, but a lot of times they'll be wrong and you need to be willing to like listen to that feedback and take it to heart and make changes from it. Yeah. A couple months ago, I, I had saw on your Instagram story, like you're going the inside of the new uh, Brewmates HQ and looked incredible. And I'm just kind of curious, like, what do you want this place to become? I don't know what the, the COVID restrictions look like right now in Denver, or if there's even a plan to get back into an HQ anytime soon. Um, but what are you hoping like for this, this place, this HQ culturally to become for you and for the company and for everybody that works with you? Yeah. I mean, so as an entrepreneur, like, especially as a first time founder, you're always just learning, uh, every, every, part of the business is new. Every, everything is an obstacle. And for me, like I had never had employees in any of my previous businesses. So I would always hear people talk about culture, mm. what's your culture like? How do you build culture? I would, you know, try and read about it, whatever. Um, and what I found was like culture actually just started with me. It was my leadership style. It was, um, the type of people that I hired and, and, you know, ultimately it, it all stemmed from myself. And so, you know, as I was starting to hire for the first time, I was really just looking for people that had the same mindset as me, like people that were passionate about what they did, um, people that were smart and honestly better at what they do than I do. So anytime I was looking for a new position, it was like, you know, when I'm in the interview process, I would talk about like, you know, the limitations of what I know, asking them questions, and I would expect them to talk circles around, mm. like make me feel dumb. You know, um, like that was what I wanted. And so we, we created this team where, you know, everyone was very self-sufficient. Um, every single person on my team is incredible. They all own a part of the business where like they're fully trusted with it and it's theirs. And like every day they get to wake up and be excited about what they're building. And so like they're part of that story and the culture kind of created itself. The culture that I created was empowering people to be able to do what they love every single day. And like how to find the joy in that. Mm. And outside of that, I mean, what we've been able to build is a team of, you know, now 28 people. Um, that, that's that real is, stuff, man. You know, 28. That's a lot. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I always like they're me. They're all me. They, they love the business. They think about it the same way that I do. They're passionate about it. They, they, you can see the passion shine through in their work. Um, and it's just a very specific personality type that, you know, in the hiring process, you know, I, I, I still actually in every part of every interview, every single interview, every person that gets hired on the company, I interview them too, because I want to make sure that they are the right fit for the brand and that they're a right fit for the culture. Because if, if you're just looking for like a leg up in your career or just a paycheck or whatever, you're not going to enjoy working mm. like and, and I'm not going to enjoy having you here. Mm. You know, I need to know that the people that I'm entrusting with parts of the business are not only just doing you know, what they're supposed to be doing, but that they're like going above and beyond and, and they're creating and always ideating around ways to make the business better and how they can better themselves. And like, that's the type of person that I want working for me. And so, you know, the team has the same idea, like when they're interviewing people, they're looking for people that are just like them. Um, people that are passionate, people that are looking to have purpose and that are excited to be able to work for a brand like Brewmate. Um, and, you know, so so I think looking back now, we've been able to create this family like bond, like every person in the company is just so like we're all so close. Um, I know every single person in the company, they all know me. They feel like we have open lines of communication. They can come to me. There's no hierarchy of like, I'm your boss or you're whatever. I mean, obviously people know who their superiors are, but we're teammates. Mm -hmm. Like we are all teammates. We're in this together. If something's going wrong or if you messed up or whatever, it doesn't matter. Like, let's have a conversation about it. Let's figure it out together. And so we've created this mindset where, you know, there, there's no like, there's no pressure to be perfect. There's just pressure to improve and always want to be better. Yeah. And, and, and that comes from being self-sufficient. So that starts with like personality type and the type of people that we bring on board anyways. And so with the headquarters, like the idea behind the headquarters honestly was just having a place for, you know, 
having community, uh, a place for people to be able to have like in-person collaboration and teamwork. Um, and we started working on this last year, you know, COVID kind of hit, we were all remote. You know, we have meetings twice a week with the whole team. You know, most of it's honestly just shooting shit and whatever, because we have meetings throughout the week of, you know, when we're working on separate projects, mm-hmm. or whatever it may be. But, you know, Tuesdays and Fridays is time for the team to get together. And, you know, we, we talk about big wins for the weeks. We talk about things that we're falling behind on or we need help with. Uh, we talk about things going on in our lives that we're excited about. It doesn't really matter. But it's been a way to kind of keep that community, um, even though we haven't been in the office. But now that we're moving back in, I mean, the idea is we're moving towards a two day in the office and three days out. Um, the idea behind it is that at home you have the capability to like be able to put your head down and get the work done, yeah. but in your own time. So it can be at six in the morning or 12 o'clock at night. You're not contained to a nine to five. And I work best that way, actually. Like sometimes it's just like I'm not in the mood, like I'm not in the right headspace to be able to do this project totally. and I will put it down and I will come back when I'm ready. Totally. And you can't do that when you're in a nine to five in office. So we're reserving the two days in the office for teamwork and collaboration. It's just a place for people to get together and work on the projects that they're working on face to face, you know, get the creative energy and juices flowing in a way that you can't really do through video. Um, you know, but outside of that, giving them the free reign to be able to kind of work on their own. Terms. So smart, dude. And I think, uh, like you were saying before, you kind of empower people so that when they're hired on the team, it's like they own a specific part of the business and they know that if things aren't getting done within that area of the business or, you know, tasks aren't being completed, there's only one person that you guys are going to go to and it's going to be this person. But giving that flexibility and understanding like, you know, I myself have those days where maybe I'm not feeling in the morning and then in the afternoon, like I just hit this like strong inspiration. I'm just like head down till 10 PM. And it's like, well, I did everything I needed to get done that day. Why do I have to work within that nine to five framework? And I think it's really, it's this whole work from home is going to completely change a lot of things in the business world, because it's like, if people are efficient and they're getting things done, I like being able to work from home, knowing that I can do laundry in between during my lunch. I can go run groceries. Like I, the Saturday and Sunday where you're like running around, running all of your errands no longer exists. Like it's a beauty when you can find that balance and, uh, you know, for you yourself and being able to kind of see that for the business and and giving, you know, your team members that ability to have that flexibility, I think is huge. And I think it's just allows them to really, when they sit down to work, they're inspired and they're in the right headspace versus like, gotta be here at 9am and you're here till 5pm. And then that's just how the, how the way things go. And I think that's incredibly smart um, on your on yourself and just your teammates. But um, yeah, a um, couple couple more things, and then we'll kind of kind of wrap this up. Um, you know, I, I read a, an article that you had said. Uh, I seriously believe that the only thing that differentiates an entrepreneur that falls catastrophically and is successful entrepreneurs is the ability to pivot. How has keeping that pivot mindset allowed you to get to where you are today? Yeah, I get asked a lot, like, what's your biggest failure? And I always tell people I've never had one because for me, I have little failures and those are triggers that I need to be able to recognize. Like if something's not going the way I thought it was going to, it doesn't mean it failed. It's just like, it's, it's a trigger for me to stop and pause and say, what do I need to do differently to make this work? Mm -hmm. And so for me, like my entire life has been these pivotal moments where you know, something's not going the way I I wanted it to, or, you know, it's not going the way I thought it was going to. I stop, I pause, figure out why, what the next move is. I make that choice. Still doesn't go the way I wanted to. I make a choice, finally get it right, move on to the next thing. And so, you know, catastrophic failure comes from ignoring those triggers. Like everything's telling you it's not working. Your customers say the product sucks. Um, You're shipping, like doesn't, whatever. Like the universe is telling you, stop what you're doing it's not going well. And they just keep pushing along. They're like, it's just part of the process. I've just got to push <laughs> further. Just got to be patient. And it's like, yeah, I mean, you know, you do have to be patient, but you've got to be willing to change and listen. And, and, you know, that that's where that pivoting comes from. So if you have a catastrophic failure, it's because you were ignoring all the warning signs. And when you have little tiny failures that build up to be, you know, the finished product, you don't look at them as failures because, you know, for me, like when I, when something doesn't go my way, I don't look at it as a failure. Like that's just life. Like nothing goes right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that I expect that nothing, like I ha- always have a theory and I expect that it's not going to go that way. And that throughout the process, it's my job to figure out how to make it work. 
Yeah. And I think, uh, the key is, is, uh, having that mindset just allows you to continuously move forward one direction. There's no, there's no going backwards. There's no back tracing. There's no getting caught up in your mind about like, well, I could have, should have, should have done that. And then you, you, you're spending so much time and energy beating yourself up and not actually making progress that when you could have just used all that energy to think, how is this helping me? And just literally just changing the perspective on, yeah, it might not have gone the right way. This maybe didn't get me to where I thought it was going to be, but this ultimately is helping shape me to be in a better position moving forward. So I think sometimes it's literally just changing the perspective and that's ultimately what allows entrepreneurs like yourself to continue to keep going because it is inevitable that you're going to hit roadblocks and have failures or not failures, but you're going to hit speed bumps. Same way within my own career, same way with literally any career path that you go. But the moment you can accept that things are going to happen and just keep that positive mindset, it just allows you to then realize there's literally only one direction and I'm going to keep moving forward. And that's the commonality that I, I see in every person that I've interviewed in the entrepreneur space, any book I've read, uh, the people that really succeed and get to the highest level are just ones that are absolutely relentless and they're not willing to stop until they get exactly what they're looking for, which I mean, you're doing, you're doing it right now. You know, um, I saw, yeah. I saw you got engaged back in July of 2020 after three plus years with, uh, let me get this name right. Is it Molly? Mally, Mally, beautiful name. I, I knew I was gonna, I was gonna screw it up. Mally, um, how <laughs> how has she made you a better version of yourself? And congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Um, you know, I think that the most important thing she's ever done for me is just listen and support me. Like she doesn't know this world. You know, it's not uh, like it's new to her when she first met me. Like she didn't know anything about it, but she can read me. She knows when, you know, I'm having a bad day mm. or when I need to talk about something. And, uh, you know, I, I usually contain a lot of that. I just kind of, you know, if, if something's going on, like I deal with it on my own, I've been used to doing that my whole life. Um, and she's like allowed me to open up and really, you know, share that with someone else. And so, you know, I think more than anything, it's just made me more open. Mm. Um, you know, she's, she's given me, kind of a new outlook on the way that I deal with stress, the way I deal with anxiety, the way I deal with anything. And it's just kind of like saying it out loud, talking about mm -hmm. it, figuring out why I feel that way and how I can get to the bottom of it. And um, yeah, I mean, she's just, she's always there for me. She's always supportive, even when I'm ripping my hair out or in a terrible <laughs> mood or whatever it may be, you know, um, she's just, she's very supportive and understands, you know, the, the world that I kind of live in. And um yeah, she's always there. So. That's beautiful. I hope I hope the wedding is an absolute banger of a party because it's gonna it's probably gonna be happening right when this pandemic is finally starting to make its way out of here. So uh, I hope that is a huge, huge success. Um, yeah, it's happening in August, so it's gonna be it's interesting. Close. We'll see Get what that happens. Vaccine there. life, baby. Get that <laughs> <laughs> um, big car guy, McLaren. I think you still have a Lambo. I think you have a Viper, and I think you have a Jesco in the works. Is that how you pronounce it? It's Jesco, yeah. but oh, yeah. Wow. So it's <laughs> over to our pronunciation. <laughs> no, you're fine, man. Yeah. So I, growing up, I mean, I was always into cars. I was always into fast things. Uh, I got my first motorcycle when I was 16. Savage. Um, Savage. I had like six or seven different bikes until ultimately I decided they're too fucking dangerous. And I had too many close calls. And there's too many idiots on the road for me to have one. So I got rid of it. And now I only ride on two wheels off road, but I still like going fast. So like, I was always interested in racing um, and yeah, I mean, I just, I was in a position where I was able to like buy one of my dream cars, which was the McLaren 720S. Wow. And I got that, like one of the first things I did was went and took track lessons and started getting in with all the drag racing groups here. And um, you know, it's kind of opened up kind of a new world for me as a side hobby, but uh, yeah, I have, I have found a new hobby. <laughs> <laughs> the man's always looking for hobbies and boy, that's a fast hobby to have. So I, I respect the, I respect the car game. Um, I got three, four quick cues. These are rapid fire and then we'll wrap up, um, daily routines that help rate that help you operate at your highest level. <sighs> Listen, man, I wish that I could tell you that I got up at five 30 and I meditated for an hour <laughs> and whatever, but I'm going to be a hundred percent transparent. No BS. I am still working Love on it. it. Because always a work in progress. I, it's always a work in progress. But you know what? For me, my anxiety stems from like 
knowing that things need to get done and that they're not getting done. Mm. And so when I wake up in the morning, like I'm amped up and ready to start the day. And sometimes I will meditate for like 10 minutes if I really feel like it. Uh, most of the time I get up, I shower, I eat breakfast and I'm getting, I'm getting the work because it's what I enjoy doing. Yeah. Um, you know, I find that for me, the most important thing though, is taking pause. Like I'm very, I try to be very in tune with myself. If I don't feel like I'm putting out my best work, if I feel like I'm in a weird funky mood, I'll go for a walk, I'll go for a run. I will meditate, whatever. Um, but you know, outside of work, I mean, I still struggle with unplugging. Um, you know, I do a lot of people, you know, they say after six o'clock, they turn their phone off. I work with people in every time zone on the planet. There's no, you know, I, I can't just turn off. Yeah. Like there's always something yeah. that needs to be done. And I think a lot of that comes with team building and building the infrastructure around to allow me to work within, a, you know, these, a more like traditional CEO role, but where we're at right now, I mean, we're a fast growing company with a pretty small team that's growing. And, um, so it's my job to kind of, you know, wear a lot of hats and make sure things are getting done. And, um, make sure that the team is growing the way that it needs to be. And, you know, eventually I hope that I can get to a point where, you know, I do have a much healthier uh, routine, but honestly, my routine right now is just consists of, you know, getting up and, uh, and getting to work and, you know, taking breaks where they're needed. And that's honestly pretty much it. The key it. is what you said though, is that you wake up and you're fired up for what you do. And I think that is just, that's literally the most beautiful thing that I'll hear this entire episode because- there's not a lot of people that can say that, that honestly wake up every single day and love what they do. And I know that it's such the norm because you have, you have built yourself to this. This wasn't luck. This wasn't handed to you. This is solely a product of your hard work, but it's so beautiful to hear that. And because I, I know that I have been in, in a place where I was doing things that I didn't love and I couldn't wait for the day to get to that position. And now I'm in a position where I wake up and I'm fired up about what I have in front of me that day. So I love hearing that. And I think the key, what you just said was that just taking the time when you're not feeling it to walk away, reset, and then get right back to it. So I think that's really crucial. Um, one book or one podcast recommendation that you recommend to anybody. I love the facial expressions already. <laughs> so I, I'm going <laughs> to listen. Be honest, I, I'm brother. Big, be I'm honest. A big, I'm a big transparency <laughs> guy. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't really Love read. It. Um, I, I spend a lot of time on Reddit. Um, I enjoy just learning about all kinds of different things outside of business. I just like to know a little bit of everything. Yeah. Um, and so that's a great place to learn. Um, but as far as books go, I mean, in my early days, I read like Freakonomics and all these different books that, you know, people recommended to me. And, you know, I think, you know, we talked in the very beginning, I said that like everyone's got their own journey. And so what I found is that like, books and podcasts and everything else, like they are what you make of them. And it's up to you to be able to listen and like pick up on what I say or what, you know, someone else is saying and just listen to the things that resonate with you or like that you can take value from, but don't like try and replicate the success. So I was looking at books the wrong way. It was like, I was trying to read a book for like the secret sauce, right? Like everyone wants to know the 10 steps <laughs> to being successful, but I didn't really find it. And so I, I, I moved more towards podcasts. Um, I listen to group chat a lot. I love D and I love those guys. Honestly, it's more for, I don't watch the news. I don't really get into politics. It's a great way just to know what's going on totally. in the world. So that's been big for me. Um, but, you know, as far as other podcasts, I, I, I really don't listen to a whole lot. Yeah. Like my, my time really outside of Brewmate is spent doing other hobbies that I have and stuff like that and spending time with my fiance. And um, I listen to podcasts when I'm in the car um, or when I have downtime, if I'm on a plane, stuff like that, like I'll download an episode, but it's not like a weekly routine. Um, so that's, yeah, that's I great. Don't have your, a lot of your learning comes from when you have a problem, you go to, cause it's like we talked about earlier with product development and everything else. Like when you have a, uh, there's something you need to understand, you go in, you go head down, you figure out the solution to the problem through research, through reading books, listening to podcasts, fix the problem, move on. And then something else pops up. So totally hear you on that. Um, area of your life you need to put more effort into. Mental health and and self care. I mean, I just talked about that. I I don't really unplug. Um, you know, it's really difficult when. Okay, so imagine your hobby and your work and everything that you love is what you do every day, right? So for me, like because work doesn't feel like work, I don't feel that I need to unplug. But 
when times are really tough or when, you know, when we're like, when I'm very, very stressed, I'm almost incapable of disconnecting from the business. Like I'm constantly thinking about like, how do I solve this problem? How do I make this go away? Like, and, and, you know, it's, it is good to have balance. Um, I, I know that, uh, I haven't found it yet. So, you know, it's something for me that I, I've, I've been working towards, you know, after six o'clock between six and eight, I have like quiet, like two hours where I try not to do emails, text, anything. And then after that, I can scroll through and find anything important that needs to be responded to. And the rest I do tomorrow. Um, you know, in the mornings, I try to not work straight away. Like I do try and make sure that like I get up, get shower, get ready for the day, eat breakfast, do all these things. Cause if I start working, I won't mm-hmm. like I'll end up showering at like one in the afternoon or like eat breakfast at three, you know, <laughs> and, uh, it's really easy to do that. But you know, for weekends for me, I'm pretty much unbothered. So on weekends I do spend a lot of time just like trying to, to unplug and, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm really, I, I would like to work towards a better lifestyle that, you know, allows me to be able to, to disconnect, um, a little I bit. Love that. I think the awareness is just as important as long as you're aware of kind of maybe that area that you need to put more effort into Then I think eventually it, it kind of, uh, comes with time. Um, what's the first step anyone can take to reaching their inner potential? Yeah. So the first thing that any show, anybody should do is really just try and understand like what they want out of life. Um, a lot of people want entrepreneurship or success or fame or whatever for the wrong reasons, um, whether it be money or a popularity contests or whatever it may be. Um, but I found this recurring thing, like every entrepreneur I've ever met is the same way. Like they're doing it because they love it. They're doing it because they're great at it. And it's something they really enjoy. And there's passion. And so you got to chase the passion. And if you're doing something like if you start a business and you're not passionate about it, there's two reasons. Like one, maybe you're not working on something that you like, or two, maybe you don't like running a business and that's totally okay. Maybe your passion is somewhere else and you should find out what that is. And like, just don't hold yourself to it. I mean, I thought that I was going to be an engineer and then it morphed into like what it is today. And so, you know, I think that just not getting too hung up on like what you believe you should be doing and more so just really focusing on like, where do you feel the happiest, where you feel the most fulfilled and you can always create and build around mm, that. That's beautiful. I think the passion is so important because, uh, if there's anything I've seen the people that chase the money it is short term. And at some point you realize this is not what I need to be doing. And you get used to that lifestyle of driving the nice car, having the nice house, but ultimately strip money aside. If money was an issue, what would you want to do for the rest of your life? I think if you know the answer to that question, that's got to be the thing you do. And I guarantee you can find a way to make a good living doing it. As we wrap up this podcast, I always allow the guests to put a challenge out there to the listeners. If they've listened this far into the podcast, they listen to Dylan Drop Gems this entire episode. What's one challenge that you have for the listeners af- after uh, listening to this podcast? When you're pursuing something new, whether it be a business, a music career, whatever it may be, just listen, like listen to other people, listen to yourself, listen to the internal dialogue that like your, your brain is trying to have with you because so often all the warning signs or or whatever are there, but we shove them down. And so, you know, it's, it's, I just challenge people just to listen to themselves, like listen to that inner voice that's telling you what direction to go to. And oftentimes it'll steer you in the right direction. So just, just be like a little more present um, and just be a little more focused on not what your brain thinks you should do, but like, what's your, you know, I say your heart, but I mean, it's like that inner voice. It's all, it's almost always actually, it's always, yeah, right. I love that Dylan. This has been uh, such a pleasure, man. Like I said, going into this podcast, have been watching you from afar since I think it was about August of 2019. And it's just so clear to me that you're passionate about what you do and he, you know, I did a lot of research before hearing some of your other podcasts and I was so intrigued by just like the amount of like different ideas and passions and hobbies that you tried to, you know, have tried in the past that ultimately became, uh, you know, you getting into brewmate and what it's become. But I just, I'm such a fan of your hustle and your mentality, how passionate you are, um, how intentional you are about like having a purpose behind what you guys have created. Um, and really just, just a big fan of you. And I think you're just a great example of somebody that has taken their journey and all these steps and really where I started the podcast off about, you know, creating your own story. I think you are such a great example of that. And I think that is so important that I even have to remind myself of daily is my story is going to be different than yours and your story is going to be different than the next person. All of our stories are very unique 
And sometimes I find myself comparing like, oh, well, it worked for this podcast or maybe, you know, maybe I need to try this or I need to do that. It's good to take inspiration from other people. But at the end of the day, I have to remind myself, write your own story. And I think you're a great example of somebody that's doing it. So please keep crushing it. Big fan of you and uh, just honored to have the have you take time out of your day to jump on this podcast today, man. Thank you, Bobby. I, I'm, I was super pumped to be able to come on the show and finally talk with you. And it was a great conversation. And I hope people you know, got some good gems out of there. Um, I always try to end my podcast with the same thing. And it's just going over like, you know, as you reflect on what you heard in the podcast and little little things that you picked up on, just remind yourself exactly what you just said. Like my story is different than yours. Mm. And so, you know, you can't just listen to my story and say, I'm going to do that, or that sounds exciting, or it worked for him. You can listen to what I said and picked out things that, that stood out to you and apply them to yourself. And at the end of the day, like you should be excited about writing your own story and that you're different and that what you're creating is different and your path is going to be different. Um, and, and that's totally okay and normal. And there's no secret to success. The secret is persistence and passion. And if you don't have those, you're not going to go anywhere. And if you do, you will eventually find your purpose. Mm, so good. Ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed this episode, please, please, please screenshot this episode, post it to your IG story, tag Dylan. He's at Dylan.Jacob and tag me at Bob A. That's B-O, three B's, four A's and Y. Share out this podcast on your IG story and let us know what you thought of the episode. And please make sure you head over to Brewmates IG. It's at B-R-U dot M-A-T-E. Go check out their content or you get over to their website at brewmate.com. Once again, that's B-R-U-M-A-T-E.com. I'll have it linked up in the description. This is very much going to be uh, the gifts that I'm going to be gifting to some family relatives for the next year or so. Got a lot of drinkers in my family, so they're going to be super pumped because I don't even think they know what brewmate is yet. So uh, this is going to be an easy delivery for them. Um, but I hope you guys and gals enjoyed this episode. Dylan, thank you again for taking the time. And uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, man. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks for tuning in. It's the Bearded Man Podcast. See ya.